Hey, this is Chris, the host of the Overflowing Life Podcast. Before we dive into today's episode, I have two quick but important requests to share with you. First, we're planning something really special and exciting at the end of this season, a question and response episode. I'd love for you to be a part of that, and all you got to do is follow us on Instagram at The Overflowing Life and DM us your burning questions or any topics you're seeking clarification on. Your participation will make this episode truly interactive and enriching for everybody. Second, we're a brand new podcast, so we rely on your support to grow and reach more listeners. If you're enjoying this content, please subscribe and share it with two other friends who you believe would find value in our content as well. Your recommendation really means the world to me and helps our community thrive. Thank you so much for your support now. On with the show. Holding a place of surrender gives me what I need to be able to be okay and relaxed. And then out of that place, I'm able to think straight. Okay, so if you're condemning yourself or you're walking in that shameful place of failure or or feeling bad, then we're not thinking clearly. So the place of surrender allows us to think clearly, to regroup, to look at other options and to see that place of suffering or where outcomes aren't coming where we want them to be with a view of positive opportunities. That all happens if we can stay in the place of surrender. Welcome, friends, to this episode of the Overflowing Life Podcast, where we navigate the crossroads of modern leadership, authentic living, and the redemptive power of business. I'm your host, Chris Lagarde. Today's episode features an enlightening conversation with Ann Weaver, a seasoned spiritual director who imparts profound insights on surrender. Our discussion goes beyond the surface, exploring the intricate relationship between surrender, the acceptance of suffering and pain, and the transformative power of humility and leadership. Anne's expertise offers a unique perspective that promises to leave a lasting impact. Enjoy. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Overflowing Life podcast. I am extremely excited for this interview uh, this week. We have a very special guest with us, um, somebody who I really respect quite a bit. Her name is Ann Weaver. Uh, She's actually a spiritual director and coach, and she brings 35 years of ministry experience to her spiritual direction and coaching roles. She actually holds a master's degree in spiritual formation and direction from Evangelical Theological Seminary uh, and a coaching certificate from coaching for clergy and a bachelor's degree in occupational therapy and psychology from Towson University. Uh, In addition to her spiritual direction practice and consults and carries leadership development responsibilities in the circles of churches she serves. And Anne and her husband, Steve, reside in Willow Street, Pennsylvania, and they have two adult daughters, one son-in-law and a grandson. And I have no four-year degrees. So after I read that, I feel a little inadequate. (laughs) But um, welcome, Anne. We're excited to have you. You know how to talk on a mic, so that works <laughs> That's for you. Right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So um, I didn't know, I was saying before we hit the record button, I didn't know what a spiritual director, I didn't know they existed until a year, year and a half ago. So would you mind filling us in, in you know, short form, what is a spiritual director? Sure. Uh, well, I would say spir- a spiritual director falls into one of the helping professions, and basically, when you come to a, to a spiritual director, you're looking to look at your relationship with God. So you're keeping track of your spiritual journey. You're looking to see how your spiritual practices are working for you. You're also looking at whatever's on your plate right now and how God is interacting with that. Um, you know, I talk about coaching being... Um, coming out of a relatively healthy place and moving you in a direction where you want to go. And you, in coaching, you have all of these different, um, you know, you're asking questions, but you're moving from one point to the other in, in spiritual direction, you're looking this way. Okay. What's going on with the same things you're bringing maybe to coaching, but what's going on in your, your relationship with God surrounding that, what, where your heart is at and how the, the Lord would be, interacting with you um, and what he might have for you in that place. I, I love your explanation of coaching being horizontal and spiritual direction being vertical. 
think that's a that's a, a great way yeah. to look at it. You, you could add the other, you know, consulting or even counseling in. There's ways to look at that as well um, in that same paradigm, but keep it the coaching and spiritual direction for the yeah. moment. Well, I, I, here's why I'm, I'm excited. Uh, Adrian and I are excited to have you on. Um, we, you know, we have some, some um, understanding of surrender. I know that for me, that's been a part of, of my life. You know, we discussed that in the last episode. And yet you, as a spiritual director, have, you know, you kind of, you work with that quite a bit in, in a lot of the ways that you work as a spiritual director. And so I wanted, really wanted to get your perspective on this stuff, especially as we equate it to the business world and business leaders. You and I had a conversation, I don't know, two or three months ago, just kind of getting acquainted with each other. Uh, and, you know, you have a good bit of understanding of leadership in the business world. And I just really respected that. So from your perspective, what's your, how would you define surrender? What, what is it? What is it not? Okay. Well, so surrender, maybe what it is not is it's, it's not coercion. In other words, we're not being forced into doing it or forced into something. It's also not resignation in ugh, that, you know, I don't know what to do and there's no hope for me. So those, those two things we, we would set aside as not surrender. I was, I've been thinking about how to define this in a short amount of time. And I think surrender is risking from a place of internal security while trusting in the external factors. So I might explain that just a little bit. You know, as we're risking from a place of internal security, what does that mean? So it means my well-being or my heart, where I'm at in life is okay. I'm able to get my basic needs met, my emotional needs met, and I know who I am. I'm okay with who I am. And if I can hold on to that, that gives me a foundation for, for risking. The other thing, the other side of that is the external factors, which have to do with, can I trust the, the people that are around me, the leadership over me, or maybe the people that are working for me? Can I trust the climate where I'm making decisions, like in a business climate? Is it positive or um, am I unsure about that? And can I trust the processes that we're going to undertake as I make decisions to move forward? All of those things, I want to have a relatively yes Yes, I'm okay with those things. They're obviously not all going to necessarily be secure, but to surrender, I'm going to say, okay, I, I, can, I can pretty much say, yes, it's worth the risk and I can trust. Yeah, that's a great description, Anne, of that. And it sounds like there's so much work that has to be done ahead of time before one can even get to a place of surrendering. I heard you talk a lot about security and internal trust and kind of having your heart in the right place. And so it seems like that even before you get to a place of surrender, there really has to be a pretty deep well of, of self-awareness and community and safety and, and everything that you just shared about. So I want to ask you, you know, when it, based on your description, it does sound like and I think most people think of surrender in terms of a spiritual context, and there is a, certainly a, a, a deep level of spirituality connected to it. But for um, business owners or leaders or entrepreneurs who maybe might not identify as being spiritual, what would you say to them? How, how would you describe surrender as being something of importance for people who are, are entrepreneurs or leaders who might not necessarily identify as religious? Sure. Well, you know, I think our our spirituality or our our lack of it, um, how we're going to see it, definitely plays in. It gives our spirituality can give us a foundation. So when we talk about the inner places of who we are and having those, you know, love and acceptance, um, let's say significance and value and security met, that. Those those things can be met if we have some sort of framework of spirituality um, that we can draw on. And so I would say that foundation is important. The other thing that spiritual our spirituality gives us is a bigger picture. 
so that when we are maybe not getting the results we want, how do we deal with that? How are we going to be able to still be okay and be able to move forward, if you're, you're thinking about business context, if we aren't able to think clearly because we're in this place of, oh, something just happened and I can't make, I can't make life work right now. I can't make where I want to go. I can't get the results that I want. So, you know, our, where we're at and how we view our spirituality is huge. Um, it can give us the confidence that we need to be open handed, which it's, that's part of surrender. You know, if you can't be open handed and say, well, yeah, I'm going to trust, but I don't know. You know, there may be some things that aren't going to work out where I want to go. And if you can't let go of that, then you're going to you're going to be in anxiety and and ill health, I would say, if if you can't meet those things. So our spirituality gives us a foundation and a place to be able to grasp on so that we can be open handed. And that bigger picture then gives us meaning and a place where we can say, OK, this has this result, whether it's positive or negative, plays into something bigger. It's not just about me. So if I, if I could summarize kind of what, what you're saying is that, uh, you know, I take the, the view you were all spiritual, you know, whatever, however we define that spirituality, I think is, is up to each person. But there's a, a there's a, you know, I think there's there's an aspect to us that is even if the if the spiritual is, you know, just kind of looking inward. But there's also an aspect that I hear you saying in uh, like I, I look at AA, right. And, and you know, they, they talk about, hey, you know, you've gotten to a place where you you believe in a power outside of yourself, higher than yourself, that you have to you, you have to you have to let go and realize I can't do all of this on my own. Right? There's got to be a, an aspect of that that we we bring a perspective to that we feel that it's safe enough to do that. Um, would that be, am I hearing that right? Does that sound right? That's okay. correct. Okay. So for a business leader, if, if the, and then applying that to the business leader, like, Hey, if, if it all is on your shoulders and it, and it, all of it depends on you, you have to control it. What I heard you say specifically is like, man, that is a heavy load to carry that will probably not go well at, after it, some point in time. And so, um, right. Yeah. We can't depend on our external factors to totally be safe. We can't depend on those things, um, for our, our being or, or our holding it together <laughs> as we want to keep moving forward, whether it's in business or other life pursuits. So I, I think, you know, in our society, it, it, Adrian and I talked about this before that it certainly seems that surrender is resisted, right? Just the word surrender, you know, it's like, no, we, we surrender is bad. Don't do that. You know, why, why is that? Why, why do you think that is? And why is surrender? Why do we find surrender to be so difficult? Okay. So surrender is I think difficult from a, a cultural perspective because we value independence. It's really great if I can know all the answers, I can make things happen, and I decrease my limitations. If I can do that, I'm highly valued. And I can feel good about myself if I can do those things. And in our culture, I would say the North American culture has a, a <laughs> sickness around this, but we really, we really say that's like the bottom line of, line, line of you're, you know, you're really doing well if you can just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And if we can't, then we're shamed. Either we are self-shaming or we're going to hear it from outside. And even if the outside isn't necessarily saying it, which it often does, we might still hear it coming in some form or another. So I would say that that cultural value of independence would be one thing that that would say would be why we don't like to surrender. Another thing I would bring up would be um, the relational rifts that we're seeing in our our culture, where there is community breakdown, or where there is family breakdown, or where we're individually 
separated or not connecting well with each other, that does not give us safety. And if we don't have safety, I think especially relationally, we aren't so sure about surrendering. Uh, why would you yield to something that uh, is not too safe for you? So those would be maybe the cultural things I look at. And and then if I'm looking at just why is it personally difficult, you know, well, my well-being is at stake. And this is vulnerable to give up control. And it just feels like, why would I want to do that? And if I'm internally just a little insecure, maybe I know it, maybe I don't know it. But underneath, we all have that need and it's going to show itself. It would show itself in saying, well, surrender isn't isn't for me. And then if our externals, um, you know, the the leadership or, you know, the processes or our, our institutions are somewhat unstable, you know, I personally am saying, wait a second, I'm not sure how much I, I want to surrender. And then I, I had those things, you know, they were coming to mind. And then another thing came that I think is important, and that is a plan for unsuccessful outcomes. If I can have a plan of how I'm going to deal with things if they don't go my way or they don't produce what I want, I'm more likely to say, okay, it's, I, I'll, I'll risk here because I have something known or I have a path that I can have outside of, um, you know, what I'm currently thinking. I'll, I think it's something definitely to explore because in, so in my story, you know, when I, two years ago when I was going through some significant shifts in my business, I know for me that the thought of failure there is definitely an aspect of like, what will other people think of me? How will I be viewed? How will I view myself? There's, there's the shame aspect. And then, you know, uh, when the concept of surrender was kind of brought into my world, I'm like, I, I, how, I can't, I can't do that. I run a business. How, how am I supposed to let go? And, and, you know, how am I supposed to not control everything? Like I, and, then when I realized that actually the control I thought I was seeking was just an illusion anyway, and that there's so little I control, that's when I'm like, okay, I, I really do have to willfully trust and surrender and, and, and allow, you know, from my spiritual side, my God to, you know, organize things. And, 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 and in, in reality, again, it's just kind of funny, you know, we, we watch our kids do certain things and and it's cute because they think they're doing something but maybe they're not and that's kind of how I look at where I was it was like I thought I was controlling all these things but the truth was is I wasn't I was actually just making it a heck of a lot worse by by bearing down and gripping on it even tighter and when when it was like okay I can kind of let go and allow things to as I like to say flow flow in the river and be what it's going to be um not giving up, not resigning, right? Not completely like sitting on the couch and shoveling potato chips in my mouth and watching Netflix, but, you know, l like just saying, okay, I know I can't control everything. That's when things kind of opened up for, for me in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of business owners in, in this and leaders, like their jobs, if they, if they have a job and they're not the business owner, then a, as leaders, our, our, our performance, it's, we either keep our job or we don't. And so, to think about the idea of surrender seems certainly very scary in a lot of ways because of that. Yes. Um, you know, what, what do we do when we feel responsible? And so we're like, how do I give up control? How do I even do this surrender thing? Right. So when I, when I'm hearing that, I become very sensitive to what's going on inside a person. Because if I'm saying, if a person's saying, I can't surrender, that speaking, that gives me a clue that, that there's some sort of things going on in that person's well-being that is not quite secure. So I'm very careful to hold a person in that place gently and 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 I'm not going to give advice or or sort of say, well, you gotta do 
or, you know, you know, that if you don't surrender, you know, like that, that kind of attitude is not going to work. So my approach is much more of a coach approach. Um, that is asking questions and trying to draw out of a person, then that would be, you know, even the spiritual direction side of things. What, what is inside that is really holding this person back from surrender? So I might begin just asking some questions and just having a safe environment for them to be able to answer and to try to think clearly about, about the whole idea of why they, they need to hold control. So a question might be, um, you know, what, what is this costing you not to surrender or what's at stake? Maybe I might dive into thinking about fears. What is the fear that you have that if you surrender, this is not going to work out well for you? Um, where do you really have control? Just raising, raising the heart and raising the self-awareness to help a person hold themselves in a place where they can see and then, okay, what, what are we going to do with this? How, how are we going to approach this? And what are, your, what are our options to relax? Because once a person is, realizes, well, I don't have control, I'm trying to hold it, and this is not the right place to be, and my heart is not exactly where I want it to be in terms of you know, how secure I feel, okay, we don't want to leave a person out there. You know that we, we want to bring... But, okay, what are our options to come into a place where we can actually let go of you know whatever it is, pride, or let go of our ourselves in a way that allows for us to risk and to trust so we can surrender? And something you've brought up a couple of times that I had not thought of before was the relationship between surrender and well-being. And so for me, I just hadn't really made that connection before. So do you think, I guess my question is, which one comes first, right? If you have somebody that you're coaching who maybe their well-being is really off and they're really struggling to surrender, is it the well-being that they need to focus on first and really get themselves whole and healthy in order to have this higher ability to surrender? Or does the surrender have to come first? And then when they let that go, then they focus more on well-being. What What are your thoughts on that? What I think is you kind of have to wait until the person's really at the end of themselves. Because when you're at the end, then you're willing to look at other things and to look at yourself. So we don't want to think of ourselves as insecure. So we're not going to automatically go there until we don't have what we need. You know, the, the results aren't working out. So when we're in that place of, okay, I'm sort of at the end of myself and I'm not sure I have anything to go on, that's when I would say we're looking then, okay, let's look at what's underneath here. What's going on? What? Why is it that you're not dealing well with this place where your, ex, as I'm calling them, external factors or the results are not working out for you. So it's kind of both. It's a both and. Yeah, it's a both and, right? Yeah, and I yeah you're thinking. not going to, you're, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're not going to get a straight answer because it depends on where the person's at and how they're seeing themselves. And where you can draw them to to that place of self awareness, it, it's sometimes through um, just seeing where they're at in their they're not getting results. Sometimes it's seeing where they're at with their heart. Yeah, I remember a couple of years ago when I was at kind of my my lowest level of burnout or highest level of burnout, actually, and kind of getting to the end of my rope, as you said, you have to wait till the person gets to the end, right? My well-being was very, very low. I felt like I was trying to control things that I didn't have control over. And so I just got to the point where I had to do both. I had to make a change to both take care of myself and change the circumstances and the situations that I did have control over. So again, probably just approaching it more with that open-handedness that you were talking about. I, I really appreciate you pointing that out, Adrian, because 
that's also not something I I thought about uh, about surrender getting to a kind of like that safe place. But at the same time, when I think about my story too, it's like man, I, I got to the end of myself, and I didn't I, I I wasn't necessarily in a safe place, but I knew I I couldn't keep controlling. I knew that my control, my lack of surrender, was not helping. And so I'm like, well, it, again, you know, going to your question, Anne, about what's it costing me? Well, that cost, I, I, I'm, that's not okay. So I've got to work on, and that, that for me, it was a, a minute by minute decision to control or not control, right? To, to grab on or not, not to. It's not like um, this is a once and done. It, there's a process in. In moving toward more and more surrender. Yeah, and, and it seems to me that what we don't, like when you have those patterns that if they're working for you, of course you're going to keep going to them. You know, if it seems to work, but once they stop working for you, there's a gift in that in a lot of ways, especially if they're not necessarily serving us or whatever. And and But we've got to hit that place where we hit a wall and we're at the end of ourselves because we usually don't face the truth and what's not working until we hit that spot. So, um, how does, you know, in in my journey, understanding the idea of detachment or, or non-attachment, um, was really important. So how does surrender relate to the concept of detachment? Yeah. Well, I, I look at surrender and detachment. There, there's uh, different kinds of detachment, and I I love the the whole detachment, the attachment theories that are out there now, and how they relate to our well being. Uh, I'm getting feedback here. Um, so spiritual detachment has to do with yielding from a place where we're trusting and our well-being is safe and we can make choices and we're able to stay fully fully engaged the way i see secular detachment is that it's a place of 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 sort of separating from whatever's going on there's no hope there's fear rising and so we want to get away from uh, whatever it is, and there's a disengagement, and we might even say we don't care, or there might even be a resignation in that, um, where we're separating from it. Gotcha. I appreciate you thinking about the, the outlining the couple. Um, never thought about different types of detachment. Uh, that's that's fascinating, and you know, so it, it, to me, if it's like, all right, well, if, if you're if you're going to be detached from the outcomes in a in a spiritual healthy way, of like, okay, well. I'm going to do what I can. Like if it, if it goes this way, I'm okay. If it goes this way, I'm okay. Um, that, that's that in order to have detachment, at least in my head, we've got to get to a point of surrender because otherwise if we're not surrendered, then we're going to hold tightly to, I need this outcome. This outcome has to happen. Um, versus, you know, the either, you know, either or, uh, and I know for, for me and making some of my decisions, uh, when I get to the point of detachment or non-attachment and there's not an emotional need there for one outcome or the other, man, I'm, there's so much freedom in how I make those decisions and the, the possibilities that come up when I get to that point. And it was that, is that just me or is that something that like is pretty common among the human experience to, to experience that freedom when we become or get to that point? I would like to interject and ask for a little coaching moment about that because I also had not thought about detachment in terms of having a healthy outcome. When I think about goals maybe that I have set out for myself that I want to accomplish, I feel very persistent with those goals and not really in a mindset of just being like, well, whatever the outcome is, I'm okay with it. No, I want a very specific outcome. And so, Anne, maybe you can talk us through, you know, how does one move to a healthy level of a detachment, even if they are in a place of high well-being, they're, 
in a good environment, things are going well for them, but they're driven to achieve a certain goal. How do they get to that mind frame of not caring so much? Or or maybe that's not the right word, but how do they get to a place where they feel a healthy detachment from the goals that they want to achieve? Open-handed. I think I think it comes back to um, knowing that if things don't turn out right, I'll be okay. And that, to me, that allows then for the surrender. And to me, the 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 indicator of surrender would be that open open handedness. Um, okay, so there may be not outcomes that are where I want them, or there may be down in the future, some suffering because of, you know, I'm, I'm moving in this way, but I, I can relax. I can relax about those things because I, no matter what, where it comes out, I'll have a plan or I'll be okay. There'll be a way forward. And, and I have some sense of that, that in here, I'll be, I'll be safe. Um, I don't know that I can really totally coach you out of your drivenness until you see that it doesn't work for you. Um, you know, you can say, well, yeah, I want to I want to surrender. I don't want to be driven. But if it's working and I'm saying working in not just outcomes, but it's working in, you know, you don't have anxiety, you're feeling like you're healthy in your relational places with your family, you know, if those things, if they start to break down because of your drivenness, then maybe we have some talking room about surrender. But if, if you don't sense any of those, I'm not sure I'm going to convince you or coach you for that matter. Um, as a spiritual director, I wait Till a person says, oh, wait a second, this isn't, this is where it's not working for me. And then we look at what's going on and what might be needed in that place. Yeah, great answer. And when you think about when people typically seek out coaches, it's because something isn't working, right? They're stuck in a pattern, they're not getting the results that they want. So yeah, I can see how, well, if you're getting the results and you're feeling peaceful and it's not having a negative impact, then what you're doing is working. But maybe start to pay attention when some of that anxiety comes up or what does the symptom look like for the individuals of, oh, this is maybe something that I need to start examining and see if it's something that I need to hold a little bit more open handedly and move into that area of surrender. Very rarely will a person who is operating out of that driven place, very rarely will that work constantly throughout life. It's going to give up somewhere. It's not going to work somewhere. You know, the youthful zeal gets you uh, really far. And then you come up against some obstacles in life. And they might be you know, your vocational place, but they might be other places that then affect your vocation. And that is when you start to say, wait a second, I need some coaching or, you know, I need something more. And that's the beginning of surrender to me. Might not be that you're going to fully surrender at that point, but you're starting then to look at, okay, I have to face my own stuff my own limitations and what I'm doing here needs some help. This brings up an interesting point in that, you know, what I I want to clarify something that being driven, wanting something is not bad, right? I, if we're speaking to leaders, right. And it does, I mean, from my perspective, God gives us the desires of our hearts. He puts them in there. They, the, the, the um, they can be distorted, but are, are, are core desires are there for a reason and to be driven or, or to want to go towards something, you know, uh, I just want to underscore this. That is not a bad thing at all. I think what, where surrender comes in is, you know, if we, we define in the beginning of the season, the first episode, we define the problem of like this soul fatigue, this like low level burnout or maybe high level burnout, like you experienced Adrian. And that's where we talk, that's where surrender comes in when things aren't working anymore. 
you know, but if you're, if your pursuit of achievement and fulfillment is, is working and there are no nasty side effects, like it's always kind of funny to listen to these drug commercials to like, listen real close for what the side effects are. And you're like, I don't want that. Like, oh my gosh. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like that. Like, you know, our drivenness and our desire to achieve can be okay. But if we're not watching carefully what those side effects really are, um, they may blindside us one day. So we just want to be careful uh, about that and be aware, right? Self-aware of what's really going around us. And you're right, Anne, like most of us, I think the, the general human experience is like, yeah, that youthful zeal gets us so far. And then at some point, those those things, those fixations, those 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 patterns that have worked for us stop working. And that's when we're like, uh-oh, I've done this my entire life. I don't know what to do now. You know, and and that's where we get to the point of like, okay, now I re- I do need to let go and and surrender a little. Yeah, desire is an interesting it's an interesting topic. You know, our desires can be disordered, and when they when when we're driven, that we have to look and watch for that disorder because. We're trying, potentially, we're trying to get something that we need from whatever we're driven toward. And that could be disorder. It could be that that's really not the place we should be getting what we need. It may not be the place we should be getting our value or our significance. It may not be the place where to be getting our security. And so that drivenness, you know, signals something there for us to to check about uh, is this appropriate? Um about, you know, how how driven we are toward, let's just say vocation, for example. <laughs> Sorry, don't mean to, to interrupt you. And and it reminded me of of um I was listening to podcasts this morning and they were talking about the need, you know, the attachment you have to something and uh, how there's been times in my life where whether it was a certain person in our organization, I thought I had to work with or had to keep in the organization, even though there was a lot of dysfunction around that person or a certain outcome I had to have where I was going to like die proverbially, I, I think that literally, but like I thought emotionally I was, it was like, man, if that doesn't happen, I'm that's really a huge problem. And and that to me, that those those should have been road signs or big signs saying, hey, dude, that's not healthy. You're looking for your needs to be met in an unhealthy, you know, not appropriate necessarily way. Uh, and those are the things that w- at least for me now moving forward, when I if I feel that attachment to something or that need to have something happen, that's where that's a, like we had talked about um uh, a canary in a mine, you know, like they used to use. It's like, oh, that's a canary. I better watch out for that. That's a sign that I need to be careful of, right? And potentially a sign that it might be time to surrender that desire. Maybe, or what, for both of you, what would what would it look like? What do people need to pay attention to to know when maybe it's time to surrender a desire? Uh, I- I'm going to jump in and just say, so in the specific instances I was thinking of where I, I had some some people in my organization that were were not, there were some unhealthy things happening and I just couldn't imagine doing business without them. And that, you know, again, when it was that, it's that willful, it's that willfulness versus willingness, like the willfulness, you can't see if you're listening in audio, but I have my my fist clenched really tight. It's like, I'm holding on to it with all I've got. That's my, that's willfulness. And I'm like, I'm going to make that happen. And anytime I feel like that now, I'm like, uh Oh, I got to pay attention because really the, the willingness I should have been willing to get to a place of neutrality or non-attachment and say, well, what's really going on here? Do I really need to have that person in my organization? Um, because the, what's happening, their, their impact on other people is not okay. And is that really what I want? You know, but I couldn't get there because I was so holding on so tight to that. And so that, to me, that was, 
at least for me in that situation was a red flag. And what do you think? Well, I, I think, you know, defining our desire. Um, okay, so I desire to do well in vocation. What's underneath that? Okay, that, there's, that's perfectly fine. I mean, we want to be successful. Um, but if I start having an unhealthy detachment to it because I'm getting what my real desires are, underneath met from that then then it's difficult or unhealthy so what are my desires underneath that that i need to be paying attention to and where should i be getting those met because if i'm trying to get them met from vocation uh it's not probably going to end up well and so, you know, we're looking at those basic, I, I'm just pulling out basic, the basic underlying desires. I desire to be loved. I desire to be accepted. I desire to be valued. I desire to feel secure. You know, I've said these a couple of times. Where do I get those met? And if my drive to be successful in my vocation is because I need those needs met, then I'm on unstable ground. Because they do not get met in that. Okay, maybe for a while I can draw something from them and receive something from that and get something. But for the most part, eventually they're they're not, you know, the vocation is not going to produce that level of meeting my desire. Yeah, that makes me think about, you know, we're going to talk about the need for authentic community. And that's one one reason why, you know, if, if every, if you're, and there's been times in my life where the, the people I work with, the people I work around were the only community I had, and that wasn't healthy for me. Uh, you know, we, because, you know, when you think about it, it's a, there's, I would, uh, you know, many cases I was in a position of power, right? So there's that dynamic working over. So mixing friendship and that dynamic can be messy at best. And, but then it's not unconditional, right? They, I'm looked at as a, as a, as a need, I'm a leader and I provide, you know, um, uh, you know, people's livelihoods to them and I have the power to terminate our, our working agreement. And so that makes it very difficult. So the, the need for authentic community, what I mean by that, when I say that is community that, that you're not working with people in, right? You've got to have community where you can be true, raw and authentic, safe and accepted and loved and and those desires that you just said and are met uh because if you're not if those aren't being you know if they're just being met at work eventually that will not work um at some point and you've got to find your significance and love and acceptance somewhere else and and if you don't have that if you're not cultivating that authentic community outside of that then i think at least from my experience i got in trouble and and that's not a place where i would want anybody listening to be Yes, and I, I would, um, I would also challenge to say that's not the ultimate place. But, you know, my 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 theology or my view of how things work plays in here, you know, big time. So I accept that community let me down. I'm sorry, <laughs> I thought I had safe community, and it was not safe. So if I did not have those needs met somewhere else. Now, we do, we do cultivate safe community, and that is healthy and it is helpful. In fact, for me, it takes me and it shows me where I can get those needs really met. It takes me toward my place with God in the midst of trouble. Um, and there's a sense in which I had to be brought to my nothingness in community and even in church community you know not just you're talking business community but you know we're supposed to find safety but you know that's not the ultimate place where my desires are going to get met but i'm not discounting it i'm just saying yeah. it's not well, it's the made ultimate. up of people that will let you down 
And I know both Adrian and I can attest to that in our, our experiences of life, whether, you know, inside or outside of work it's, and, you know, we will be, it's just the nature of, um, you know, where we're at in, in time and history that we will be let down. I think that's one thing you can count on. Uh, and, and so I appreciate you being vulnerable and bringing that up and sharing that. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Ann. Um, we're, we're getting close to our uh, time that we, uh, our, our time with you, Anne, and I want to be respectful of your time. I was just curious, a couple more questions I want to clarify. Um, one is, I don't think we've touched on this yet. How, how can surrender really help or transform our understanding of suffering or hardship? If that makes sense. And I know for me, man, in, in the, in this period I went through, uh, recently, it, it, it did transform it from a time of resistance to a time of kind of going with the flow. And and if I'd stayed in that resistance, man, for me personally, it probably would have, you know, really been very, very detrimental to me um, at the end, you know, and, and versus now where I think I'm, I'm at, it's a much more healthy, free, peaceful place for me. So, you know, what would you say? Well, um, we have to remember that surrender assumes that internal place of well-being is okay and that reasonable risks can be taken in terms of trying to get good outcomes. We can trust into that. So suffering begins to happen when those external factors or our results or, you know, the outcomes aren't playing out. That's that's a we begin to suffer in that place because it's not feeling good anymore. And so we're remembering we're in a place of surrender. And if we're in the place of surrender, this internal part is okay. And so that means I don't have to um, self-condemn. I don't have to let shame penetrate because I'm okay. I'm internally okay in that place. And so holding a place of surrender gives me that, um, what I, what I need to be able to be okay and relaxed. And then out of that place, I'm able to think straight. Okay. So if you're, you're condemning yourself or, or you're, you're walking in that shameful place of failure or, or feeling bad, which we would call suffering, then we're not thinking clearly. So the place of surrender allows us to think clearly. It allows us to regroup. It, it allows us to look at other options and to see that place of suffering or where outcomes aren't coming where we want them to be with um, a view of positive opportunities. And, and that all happens if we can stay in the place of surrender when our when our outcomes are not coming going where we want them to go i love what you just said about how being in a place of surrender allows us to see clearly wow that is so beautiful it 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 opens up options and we don't have to be in that move away fear place right it's not fight or flight gives us an opportunity to not necessarily minimize or dismiss the pain or the hardship, but to maybe understand what is the opportunity in this? How can I kind of remove my my ego or my even desire from this and really understand how can this, how can I see this a little bit more clearly by entering into this open-handed place of surrender? Yeah, I love that. It allows us to, to let go. So suffering allows us to let go of our pride. It allows us to have opportunity to live into humility, which I would say um, humility is one way to practice surrender. If we can, if we can humble ourselves, if we can... Um, if we can say, I have limitations, I, I can make mistakes, and I need help. You know, if we can be in that posture, 
if suffering can take us to that place, then then the opportunities can open up. Then we can say, well, I guess I can listen to my wife or, you know, anybody close to us, right? You know, but we're not going to be having to hold on. I have to be right and I have to do it myself anymore. But it takes practice to live into being humble. And it's not the thing out there that oh is gosh. honored. No, just open up social media and it is not about being, and I think that's part, I mean, that plays into all of this, the ego, feeding the ego, saying, hey, look at me, validating my value as a human being by saying like, oh, look at me, you know, um, that's, that, and that's, humility is one of those uh, values. I think that's, that's suffered in the recent past. Um, and suffering is also something that, and then I may, you know, be projecting onto our society here for a minute, but my, I don't know. I think for me, uh, for a long time, I just thought, you know, to be frankly vulnerable as somebody who has faith in, uh, in Jesus, I'm like, okay, well, I'll be good. Everything will go well for me. And it's like, no, my gosh, no. Like, and, and suffering, no. And suffering is a very, suffering is a very important part of our our lives you know it brings into uh, it, it really brings into um view our lim- our limitations and and the need to be humble like you're saying and if we if we resist surrender if you if you don't surrender to that and you resist it push back against it 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 feels like you're just you know you're hardening who you are you become less flexible and set in this like opposed position as opposed to just surrendering, which is kind of being like soft and moldable and like humble and like, okay, this is not what I want. This is painful. This hurts. Um, you know, and I, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to believe there's something in this for me. There's purpose in it. So I'm, I'm going to choose to surrender to it. Yeah. I, I think having, um, that bigger, bigger picture allows for meaning to come out of the humbling places or, you know, the suffering. Right. And suffering can teach us, right? So many people have gone through terrible suffering experiences and they come out having learned something about themselves or others on the other side of it. Yes. And, and I would say this is beyond learning. Our, our suffering takes us just beyond, you know, because we can say, well, let me learn what I'm supposed to learn so I can get out of this, you know. But I say it takes us toward relationship. When we're suffering, we need relationship. So it, it can be relationship horizontally here with those in community with us, but it's also relationship with God. It takes us to that place where we have to look at that. And, and if we don't, then we're 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 not going to get we're not going to have that bigger picture and one of the strategies you i was just going to ask about more strategies or more ways to practice surrender so you had said that humility is one way to practice what are some other ways individuals can practice surrender um that's that's the big one that's the big one i have but i think the the ways of humility, which would include like delegating, having a team where you're asking for help, being a, what we would call in the church uh, a servant leader. That is the kind of person that doesn't see themselves above everybody else, but leads from a place of um, drawing others in and getting the discernment from those around them. And then, you know, the leader has to maybe make the final decision sometimes, but they have drawn in and respected those that are around them. So, And then not having to do everything yourself. That's another way to practice. You know, you're surrendering to, okay, I'm going to I'm going to let this person learn, you know, <laughs> and they might not get it right. It might affect my bottom line somewhere here, but it's worth it because 
that person is going to grow and I need that person. I need that person next to me. So those may be a few, you know, I would say those places that put us in a place of humility and make us come down in under any, any activity that does that is going to propagate the, your ability to do um, surrender in the harder places maybe. Yeah. So I'm hearing you say that delegating is actually a step to surrender because you're releasing control of something. And so for leaders, for entrepreneurs, delegation, that could be one small step, one practice that they take to to surrendering. It's not this really big, huge existential thing. There's day to day applications and delegating can be one of those ways. Mm -hmm. I think also. Being honest like not trying to hold something up that's not real, being real with where we're at here as whether that's in, in our work or in like, let's just say the business, how it's going or being real with how we are being together as we're working together. That honest, this is where we're at place goes a long way to helping me surrender. Okay, it it actually makes the environment safe, which is one of the things you need to be able to surrender. Yeah, when I when I think about, you know, practical advice on 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 surrender, you know, that the aspect of humility and and delegating. Yeah, I, it's 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 like a, it's the awareness of and what you said about being honest, it's getting to a place of truth of Okay, I gotta stop. You know, I gotta stop BSing everybody and and say mm, this is not working, uh, and this or this is harmful in some ways. And instead of saying, you know, just keeping a mask on and saying it's all good, no, there's some things that that aren't working. And yet sometimes that awareness can really be hard to come by if we're so attached to things, which is why some of the practices we're talking about on this season, such as solitude and silence and reflection, contemplation, rest, community, all those things are really important to give your, 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 your soul, as we talked about it before, that place where you're aware, there's awareness, there's reflection, you, you know yourself and or God in a sense, and okay, give that space to breathe and to, to flourish. Otherwise, if you're just your head's in your phone all day, or it's in your computer, you're going, 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 you never have a moment to to sit down and reflect, then that you, how are you going to be aware? In fact, it was, it was funny. I had a coaching client earlier today. They were telling me that we've been talking about slowing down. We had been talking about creating margin and it had been a month or so. And we, there were two weeks, we didn't have a call. We got on the call today and they told me, you know what? It's really funny. I didn't do anything this past weekend because I needed that time. And it's amazing the clarity that came after that time. And, and I just had to smile and laugh at them and say, you know, okay, you know, I didn't, I'm not going to say I told you so, but it, it, but we need that. How are we going to, what's that? Yeah. Well, maybe, but, um, we were, you know, it's like, we need that awareness. We, and in order to have that awareness and to surrender, we've got to slow down and have some of that margin and, and breathing room mentally. So, yes. I love that reflecting, uh, slowing down. Part of that is um, having other people reflect with you. If I, if I say, I, I need your feedback. How do I look? Even as a leader, you know, what's coming across to you? How is my attitude? You know, we have these 360 reviews or, you know, all of that. But, but make it a practice to have at least a few people and then you know people that may not you may not think are on your best side reflect with you and say look i need to know could you please be gentle with me i want to hear how i am with you and that you know draws draws you in then and that's a practice it's something we can do and it's not normal because we're scared. <laughs> but if I have that place in here, I'm okay. You know, I can, I can, I can take what you say to me when you say, you know what, you should wear your hair in pigtails or something. 
you know, like that's important. <laughs> if I do that, maybe, maybe I'm going to get the result I want. You know, I'm just joking, but you know what I'm saying? That feedback from others and how they perceive me, I still can make my own decisions about how I'm going to be, but I get a, an opinion and I get some, some clarity um, that I might not be able to have just in my own reflective, quiet down weekend. Yeah, and, and that, 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 it right there is surrender by asking for feedback and being willing to let go of control. Correct. It's a way to practice. Asking for honest feedback from people mm-hmm. that are mm-hmm. trustworthy. But it re- requires humility, which also sets the stage for psychological safety. So it's Correct. it's just all intertwined. Well, um, listen, I, you know, we're just about out of time here. Um, you know, any last thoughts from you, Anne, um, or Adrian, before we, uh, we wrap this up, we covered a lot, a lot more than we intended, which is what I knew would happen. And what was hoping we would happen. We we've, there's some deep conversation that I, I don't think business folks normally talk about, but need to talk about. So, um, last thoughts before we wrap up. I loved what she said about surrendering allows us to see more clearly. And so I think that that's definitely something that is going to be stuck in my mind that I will be reflecting on and seeing if there are some areas um, in my life that I need to let go of and hold a little bit more openly and see what kind of clarity comes from that. How about you, Chris? What's your takeaway? Yeah, I, I think humility kind of came to mind, and and you know it's something that's always been you know authenticity is very high on my value list, um, and along with that comes some good level of uh, humility, and I think that that the role that humility plays in surrender is really important. And that's not something I've I've thought about before, and so um, you know all and all the stuff that goes along with being humble and humility. So I might I might just say thank you you know, for the opportunity and, and the, you know, the two of you are onto something, I think, by trying to dredge up, you know, what's, what's underneath and how, how we relate into spaces where we don't always look. I would just affirm that. And I think what it does is it, it allows normalization for us to go in places where society may not go. And yet, we need to go and who's going to go there unless we go first and those we that are around us begin to see that they can go there. So thank you. And, you know, thanks for barking up this tree and for letting me be involved. And it was such a delight talking with you. And just thank you. You dropped so many nuggets of wisdom, such great conversation. So thanks so much for joining us today. Well, Anne, thank you so much. Uh, for anybody that wants to connect with Anne, we're going to put her, got permission to put her uh, email address in the show notes. So please reach out to her. I'm sure she'd be thrilled to hear from you and uh, would love to, to hear from any folks asking more questions. And as always, please, we want to hear your thoughts. We, at the end of this season, we're going to do a question and response episode with uh, some of the best questions. So let us know what those questions are and what your thoughts are. What's your experience been with, uh, with surrender and, uh, you know, engaging in that. So Thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for listening this week. Next week, join me for part one of three parts as I interview Phil Carnuccio, a seasoned leader with 32 years of experience. He's going to share some invaluable insights on the intersection of emotional intelligence and effective leadership. We're going to dive into some strategies and practices that can transform your leadership approach and enhance your personal growth as well. And I promise you, if you're a business leader looking to elevate your game, this will be a very valuable episode. One of my favorite conversations this season. So here's a quick preview. I would question what is compelling me. Because what compels us, Chris, and what fuels us is just as important, if not more important, than what we do. If you're a business leader out there listening to this, you can have a great business, but the question isn't how great is your business? What's more important is what is compelling you? Thank you so much for tuning in to The Overflowing Life. If our message struck a chord with you, please subscribe and connect with us. Share your thoughts, questions, and stories with us on Instagram at The Overflowing Life or visit TheOverflowingLife.com. And if you're looking for coaching that helps you create an overflowing life, please reach out to us. We'd love to partner with you. See you next week. <music>